From the studios of Cheshire TV in Keene, Hampshire, it's The Men's Room, a show by men, about men, and for everyone. Sponsored by the Monadnock Men's Resource Center and hosted by Damian Licata and Forrest Seymour. Hello everyone and welcome to The Men's Room. I'm Damian Licata and this strange person sitting next to me this week is Don Tretler, who was kind enough to stand in for Forrest Seymour, who is not available today. So uh, we are uh, The Men's Room. We're sponsored by the Monadnock Men's Resource Center. Um, we also uh, sponsor a men's support group that meets every Sunday night, which we will talk to you more about at the end of the show. Um, but Don, I wanted to thank you for standing in like this. Oh, you're welcome. It's, it's my pleasure. Yeah. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Um, Don, you're also uh, associated with the Monadnock Men's Resource Center and have been for right since um, its inception, I believe. I'm one of the volunteer facilitators. Yeah. Uh, I've been part of the team for about five years, I think. We're going uh -huh. on five this year. That's right. We are. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, I, and you've been uh, um, involved in, uh, in doing other kinds of men's work and work with boys, I understand? Well, I've been exploring um, a group called Boys to Men, which is going to uh, they get involved in doing a rite of passage, uh, modern day, to try and help uh, young men. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also have done some workshops based on the Tough Guys film, mm -hmm. um, trying to help out with some of the youth. And I, and I work with youth in, a, mm -hmm. in a foster care right now in the state of Vermont. Yep. Tough Guys, for those who are familiar with it, is, the guys is spelled G-U-I-S-E, and it's, it, it deals with that sort of uh, tough persona that uh, particularly young men and boys uh, try to uh, emulate and where that comes from and, right. and what it leads to very often. Right. I thought it was a good opportunity uh, for some of the youth that I work with uh, at the annual youth conference to address that and to kind of look into, uh, you know, what the male persona is while these young people are still trying to develop that. And I usually get a pretty good turnout of, of young ladies as well at, these, at the workshops. And I try to let them know that they're going to be mothers, girlfriends, wives of men. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Yep. they're taking that into consideration as good as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, it's great. It's great work, and uh, and we're really happy to have you here today. Uh, well, thanks. It's great to be here. Yep. And we have a uh, uh, we have a great guest today, and uh, um, I think it's particularly appropriate that you be here for this guest. And uh, we might talk a little bit about why that is. But uh, um, could you could you let us know a little bit about uh, who we've got today? Sure. Today we've got A. Page, who's uh, I'm trying to think. He's got a lot of initials, uh, alphabets. He's an, he's an MA. He's, a, he's a, got a master's degree, mm -hmm. licensed social worker, mm -hmm. uh, VSO. Um, I'm not sure what that stands for, but I'm sure it's we'll pretty, impor pretty important. Yeah. Having something to do with veterans, I'm guessing. Yeah. yeah. He also attended Niagara University, mm -hmm. as well as Wayland Baptist University. He got his master's degree from Antioch, New England Graduate School. Right here in Keene. Yeah. Yeah. He's a licensed social worker in the state of Massachusetts. He's federally certified veteran service officer and career counselor. Mm -hmm. AJ's also a graduate of the U.S. Army Ranger and Airborne Schools. He's a 22-year retired command officer with combat service in Central America, Panama, and the first Gulf War, and Somalia. He currently is employed by Monadnock Family Services as the PATH Homeless Outreach and Veterans Clinician, which he's been doing for about a year. He also uh, works with the VA Vet Center in Springfield, Massachusetts as the Readjustment Counseling Therapist. He's also, a, a, I don't know if I would say, involved with Vietnam Veterans of America. He's the Veteran Service Officer, mm -hmm. which he's been doing since, since 2000. Right. So that is uh, mighty impressive, and we are really <laughs> lucky to have you here. Thanks, Damon. Um, AJ, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Damon. Yeah. Thanks, Don. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and uh, kind of help clarify a little, because, of course, a lot of people look at that and, and go, well, what, is, what is VSO? Oh, yeah. And to answer your question, it's Veteran Service mm -hmm. Officer. Um, when people hear the term VSO, they, they scratch their heads and go, that's a strange kind of an animal. Um, each of the veteran service organizations in the country, whether it's the Disabled American Veterans, American Legion, VFW, were the more ones, or even organizations like Vietnam Vets of America or Swords to Plowshares even, 
um, have federally accredited veteran service officers in each state that help veterans pursue and prosecute claims against the Veterans Administration for the benefits they rightly deserve. Mm -hmm. um, I had a wonderful benefit about six years ago. I was approached by the Vermont State Council for Vietnam Vets of America and asked, well, would you consider being our veteran service officer? Um, you have a good understanding of veterans law. Um, you have a good background uh, with counseling. We'd like you to be the person to do it. And as they put it, um, you're just younger enough th than all the rest of us that, well, when we're all dead or old and decrepit, you could help file our claims. So <laughs> there you I, go. I got asked to step in. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about today. Yeah. And, and uh, um, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about your work with, with uh, homeless individuals. Absolutely. Um, particularly homeless men. Yeah. And and your work with veterans and how those intersect because I think that uh, if you know that there are uh, probably a number of veterans who may find themselves in that situation of yeah. not having a place to live absolutely and um, there may be a lot of uh, you know factors about them being vets that contribute to that Am I right? um, th there's a lot of factors uh, mm -hmm. that contribute um, as a mental health clinician now I've, I've seen more and more um, one of the primary things that causes homelessness amongst veterans and amongst so many other people um, is mental health issues. And of course, the number one issue with veterans, as many of us have heard according to the news, is post-traumatic stress disorder. And very often that is comorbid with substance abuse, anger issues. There's a lot of things that tie into that post-traumatic stress disorder. And nowadays, especially what's happening is more and more of the homeless population is veterans. And it's not just male vets, it's also female vets now, because as you and I had spoken about a little bit before the show, Don, the face of our military has changed. Mm -hmm. um, there are as, a lot more women serving, and a lot more women serving in combat. Absolutely. And, and as we had discussed, um, something very unusual happened within the last six years. Uh, for the 20 years that I was in a uniform, um, there was a very, very, very strong push, especially from those of us in the Ranger community, that did not w want women in a combat war. They were afraid of what would happen. And in actuality, what happened was women stepped into a combat role without anybody realizing what had, ha what had occurred. Uh, the old standard of, well, you know, women should be behind the lines ceased to exist when Jessica Litch's convoy got hit and suddenly everybody realized there were no more front lines. Right. And the reason it's so important now, especially with what's happening in the homeless community, um, there are more and more people who are becoming homeless who are vets because what happens for so many of them, the military, they're never told about the benefits they're entitled to or given any proper readjustment counseling. And what happens is they come back angry, upset, feeling abandoned by the military they had or, or unable to reconnect with the society at large because it lacks the continuity and the camaraderie they were used to in a uniform. And so what happens is after they lose the first two, three, four, seven jobs in the case of one young man I'm working with right now, mm -hmm. um, next thing they know, well, if they can't hold a job, they can't hold a place to live, and they become homeless. Um, the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans has said that on an average, there are upwards of 700, excuse me, 750,000 or more veterans homeless every night on the streets in this country. Mm. Um, that's an epidemic. Yeah, sure we is. began to pay attention with the Vietnam vets. We kind of glossed over it with the war veterans and the Somalia veterans. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is the current conflict will not allow us to stand back and ignore it anymore. PTSD, substance abuse, and so many other issues are tied too tightly into why these people are homeless. Mm -hmm. So what kind of uh, um, uh, barriers do you, do you run into when you're working with uh, these, uh, both men and women, in terms of you know, within the community and, and uh, you know, how to get them back on their feet? The first barrier, more than anything, is with, with the individual themselves. It's, it's an issue of trust. And that happens not just with the military population or veteran population, but anybody who's been homeless. Um, it's very easy for them to get a bit of a callous skin and feel that you know, nobody can help me, nobody cares, and it's just going to be another system passing me along. Um, Keene, especially in this area, has an epidemic 
proportion of homeless people around here, and we don't even realize it. If you look behind down the road or in the woods from the hospital, mm -hmm. or even out behind where the old drive-in theater used to be, mm -hmm. um, at any given time, you're likely to see a tent sitting out there, and that person in that tent is not camping. Right. That's their home. Mm -hmm. um, and people in this area don't realize just how big an issue. Not out is. sleeping on the sidewalks in the center of town, which is what we, that sort of classic idea of a homeless person. They, and again, this ties in with PTSD, mm -hmm. they isolate. Right. And again, that's where the trust issue comes in, because very often somebody like myself or Karen Bedarsky from Southwest Community Services will actually have to outreach, go into the woods, and slowly begin the process of regaining their trust in systems because they have been burned by the system so many times. Um, so you, you don't sit back and wait for these folks to come to you and say, you know, I'm homeless, you know, I need a place to live. You go out in the woods and, and, and find these people. Well, as they put it, the best defense is a good offense. Uh -huh. If you want to achieve any kind of goals with this, yeah. you have to go out and do the work. Uh -huh. They're not going to come into you. Right. Um, and again, it's that trust factor. Uh -huh. And one of the things that I have found out over time, uh, so much of the trauma work I do with vets uh, works very closely, again, like I've said, with the issue with folks who are homeless. Um, for a lot of them, they don't want you to understand. You can't understand. You've never worn their skin. You've never looked through their eyes. So you can't understand where they've come from. But you can get it. Mm -hmm. You can get the circumstances they're under. You can look at them as a fellow human being instead of just a charity case or somebody who wants or needs welfare. And unfortunately, our systems have looked at people too long in that light. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Don, you, you um, are a veteran yourself, correct? Right. That was something we kind of alluded to. I spent uh -huh. four years in the Marine Corps um, from 84 to 88 yeah. mm -hmm. uh, during President, President Reagan's, um, I was going to say, reign. You know? <laughs> oh, <yes. Yep>. Apt. <laughs> uh, and and uh, um, so coming coming back from you know from reentry into civilian life, um, you know I don't uh, um, you weren't were you in any you weren't in a combat mission in that period. No, actually I don't qualify. I, I have some friends that are involved with uh, the. Uh, I'm drawing a blank, American Legion. Okay. One of my friends is pretty prominent up in my area in, in mm -hmm. American Legion and has invited me to come down there. Mm -hmm. And when I went to apply, I realized I don't qualify because you have to be in some kind of a combat mm -hmm. uh, situation or, you know, uh, or the country had to be at war at some time. Right. And I yeah. fit snugly right in between everything. Yeah. Right. Well, you, you know, some would say you were very fortunate. Right. Uh, the, uh, but there's still a transition from one culture to another. Um, from a military culture, even if it's not in a combat situation, mm -hmm. to a, a milder degree, there is, right. I imagine, Absolutely. an adjustment, right? Absolutely. When I was doing um, employment work with the Vermont Department of Employment and Training several years ago, yeah. uh, part of my position is disabled vets outreach. I do this outreach thing an awful lot. Uh -huh. um, one of the things that became very evident is, on an average, it takes at least a year for somebody to wear a uniform to reintegrate into society at large, especially the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, we, as a culture within the military, bring out some very, very bad habits or unusual habits to the civilian workforce. One of the things that happens, and, and the greatest example I've ever used is, is during the interview process. Mm -hmm. So many vets walk into an interview and get hammered right off the bat by the questions the interviewers ask, which seem very normal to anybody who's never been in the military. Mm -hmm. but the Can you give an example of that? Absolutely. The, the first time an interviewer looked at me and went, where do you see yourself in five years? Oh, I gave question. the standard military answer. Yeah. I see myself in your job. <laughs> OK, you're not going to get hired here because you're coming after my job. Right. Um, that is, though, a standard answer in the military. Mm -hmm. Because when a young soldier or sailor goes for a promotion board, they get asked by a unit first sergeant or sergeant major, where do you see, see yourself in five years, young troop? Doing your job, sergeant major, which is what they want to hear. Sure. They come here, and a civilian employer goes, who does this guy think he is? Right. Um, in a lot of cases, too, the veteran also speaks a language. Again, that goes into that acculturation thing. 
Uh, but the veteran speaks a language that they have to relearn English all over again. It's a they lot may, of jargon, a lot of military. Absolutely. Um, and, and they may speak things within an interview process that terrifies an interviewer because the interviewer doesn't know what the guy or gal just said. Um, perfect example. I came off active duty. My last job title was actually as a company commander. I had $8.2 million worth of equipment under me, under mission table of organization and equipment. Um, I had more than 80 soldiers under my command at any given time, 380 at the absolute largest point. Um, and I was tr entrusted to go worldwide under some of the most severe conditions. Well, somebody who runs a mom and pop business down here in Keene goes, wow, this person should be making 40 grand a year or higher and Way over I can't time. pay him. Right. And so there's that panic issue. Sure. Um, and in a lot of cases, it, it's a language issue. It's an acculturation issue. And again, that begins to play into PTSD because what starts out as problems with readjustment mm -hmm. later on may or may not blow into full bore PTSD because nobody's actually given them the chance mm -hmm. to readjust. Right. I, I was going to say, my, my adjustment, I. I uh, it was probably unique because I was I was had planful. Mm -hmm. I came out. I I was discharged uh, right before Christmas, and I entered right into college the very next semester. And what I did was I went only to college for the first semester. I didn't do anything else. That's all I did. That was my mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. um, during the summer after that, I took on a job. So then I was going to school and I was working, and I kept picking up. I would do something more than I, the next semester. Mm -hmm. I went to school full time, I worked. So, so you sort of, you, you sort of, you know, ease yourself in by steps. Right. Because right. I, I mean, that was unique for yeah. me. I knew that was going to be best for me to, to try to like, mm -hmm. you know, jump into everything. Because yeah. I had only gone to school part time while I was in the middle military. So. Right. Mm -hmm. And you were single at the time, too. And I was right? single at the time. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference, too, for a lot of those folks coming out who have been the traditional breadwinner in their family. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that military career was the sole income. Right. And they have that feeling they have to come out and go to work right away. Mm -hmm. And very often, they're, for them, the transition has to be very fast. And not all of them can pick up that transition that fast. Um, and of course, their spouses very often. And again, it's not just men. Sometimes it's the female veteran who's in that, that role as well. Um, and so very often what happens is that primary breadwinner winds up self-destructing mm -hmm. in the job interview process or the application process because they have laid so much pressure on themselves to succeed. Right. And make makes feel very, very right. Exactly. Sure. Um, I, I wanted to ask you too. I mean, your your education and your experience uh, are, are particularly, um, uh, you know, well suited. I think to what you're doing and the kind of work you're you're, you're doing. And the the you had mentioned you know mental illness uh, uh, briefly before. And uh, one of the things that that often um, is correlations that have often been made are issues around. Um, the military in general, and very often veterans trying to re-enter civilian life, right. in terms of, of their adjustment you know, issues, you know, difficulty with adjustment, and, and also sort of re-entering family life, because very often they've been you know, separated from their families. Absolutely. And um, you know, a lot of the ways in which people relate in the military um, don't work within the family unit, right. and cause, can cause a lot of problems, not the least of which can be domestic violence. Right. But one of the things that does actually benefit so many vets um, is the fact that when you begin to explain to them, especially with marital and family therapy, that families work under systems. And once you begin to take the systems approach to family therapy with a vet, for them suddenly doors begin to open and they begin to see, oh, hey, this, this is something I can understand. Because for them, they've worked within systems and structures of squads, teams, companies, battalions, they can understand, okay, everybody has their place. But for a lot of them, it's beginning to realize that a family doesn't always work 100% mm -hmm. under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. That's right. what begins to make it easier sure. for so many of them. Yeah. And for a lot of them, too, there is, there is the anger issue mm -hmm. that so very often becomes the focal point of domestic violence. Um, 
it becomes an issue for them of no other way to vent or very often the domestic violence is a result of a flashback. Mm -hmm. um, great example I've given because I, I work uh, first and third Tuesday nights of the month with other combat veterans mm -hmm. uh, in a men's group that we do uh, through Monadnock Family Services. Oh, that's terrific. So that's a, that's a support group? That's for a support group uh, for any veteran uh -huh. uh, with combat experience. Um, and one of the things we've discussed is very often for so many of them, um, when they initially came out of the service, they had a domestic violence incident occur, or what they felt was domestic violence. And what it was, was their reacting to their family without realizing it was a family member. Mm -hmm. um, great example, almost every single uh, man in that group has talked at one time or another of having a nightmare or a dream and winding up kicking or you know, hitting a spouse or kicking them out of bed or being asleep on a couch and having a, uh, one of their children come in and mm -hmm. grab them without realizing you, right. you can't wake daddy that way. Right. That and startle reflex. Is, that is, startle reflex dangerous. is huge. Yeah. Because when you think, for example, uh, somebody who say who's been, spent the last 18 months in Ramadi, mm -hmm. okay, that startle, startle response mm -hmm. kept them alive. It's not something right. you can just turn off. It's gonna mm -hmm. be with them the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. What's important to help them, though, is help them realize how to set up structures within their household and within their family mm -hmm. system so that their reactions don't create a domestic violence situation. Mm -hmm. They don't start on the road yep. of anger and alcohol and self-fulfilling prophecy yep. of family damage. Right. Um, one thing that has become very, very important for a lot of vets, especially recent returnees, is that feeling a need that, well, I need to reconnect with my family. And very often they feel they can't. And it's one of the reasons Vietnam Vets of America's big quote has been, PTSD does not mean you're crazy. Um, it's getting them and their families to understand and realize post-traumatic stress disorder is not fundamentally somebody who's crazy. It's somebody who's reacting to a stressful environment around them. Mm -hmm. and helping them readjust now to the environment they're back in is going to help them continue to live a healthy, normal life. Right. What, um, you know, we, we just have a couple of minutes left, so I, I wanted to ask you to, to um, what, what kinds of things can families do, can communities do for the return of that um, to help, you know, ease this transition, to help avoid this sort of trajectory that, that a lot of vets end up yeah, you know, end up in a tent in the woods? The first thing, find them somebody to talk to. Whether it's calling, again, our agency, Monadnock Family Services, um, and I can do the number by heart if you want me to pitch that. Go ahead, that. absolutely. 603-357-4400. Um, uh, mm -hmm. um, of course, Carla Kirsch and I are two of the primary people to talk to, but any okay. counselor or clinician would be of great help. Um, calling the local vet centers. Uh, there's a vet center in Manchester. There's one in White River who we work very closely with uh, mm -hmm. that actually works with VA Hospital. And their number is 802-295-2908. Calling the Veterans Administration Hospital itself if necessary. Uh -huh. Or if all else fails, even calling a local service organization, picking up the phone and, and calling an American Legion post or VFW mm -hmm. post and going, hey, my son, my daughter, my uncle, my cousin is just back or, you know, hasn't been quite the same in the last two years. Could he talk to somebody? Because very often, especially in working with anybody with, with PTSD, with combat trauma, that coming in the door phase, that very first phase of treatment is yeah. always the hardest because it's the one thing the vet has to do alone. Right. If their families want them to succeed, want to help them, then help them by giving them the support they need. Okay. Pick up the phone. Right. Good. Good message. Um, the um, uh, and and just once again recap the support group that you're doing right now. Yeah. When does that happen? How do they connect with? Them? I, again, number to call is is for Manandak Family Manandak Services. Family Services. Yep. Six zero three three five seven four four zero zero. Okay. Um, the again the primary way to get into that group is mm -hmm. contact myself or Carla Kirsch or one of our support staff at MFS okay. um, and get in 
to talk to a counselor first and then get mm -hmm. integrated in with the group. Okay. Um, because again, it's, it's that unit thing, it's that mm -hmm. camaraderie thing. For very many of us, we need that support that we felt we were in a uniform together. Yeah. All right, well, I want to thank you very much. No, thank and you. We could talk for a lot longer Absolutely. and a lot more depth about this. It's a complicated issue. And, uh, and I just want to congratulate you on the great work you're doing. Thanks, Damien. Yeah, thanks. Um, I had plenty of questions. I was. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. I'm sure well, we can answer. Yeah, you got to, you got to, like, you know, tell me to shut up. That's the no, thing. no. I was. <laughs> we were just going down a different, different angle, and I had been thinking of questions before I came to. Okay. Well, um, uh, I do want to say uh, a little bit about our uh, men's support group. Um, mm -hmm. We also do a support group. This is an open drop-in support group, and it's open to all men. Um, that would include veterans, but it's uh, really any male. Um, these are around town, these brochures that talk about it. Um, we do this on, uh, uh, at the Life Arts Center every Sunday night from 7 to 9, right? Right. This week I will be facilitating if, you know, there you I go. seem like an open enough face. person. We'll be there. That's right. And um, it's at the Life Arts Center. It's located at 25 Roxbury Street right here in Keene, New Hampshire. Um, and we would encourage you to stop by. Also, this program is uh, archived on YouTube, and the best way to get to that, it's also on our website, uh, is to go to uh, www.mmrconline.org, and there's a link there that will uh, take you to the archived uh, uh, programs, and we would encourage you to get in touch with us, let us know what you think, send us an email, um, and we'd love to uh, be able to read your emails on the program and, and respond to them. So thanks again. Thanks, Don. I really appreciate your coming well, by. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to doing this for a little while. It so. was fun to have you. And, you know, there'll be other opportunities, too. It'll be great to, to have you back. Terrific. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Sure. You made it easy. Thanks, AJ. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thanks again, Damon. Thank you. It's great to have you on. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Don. Thank you.